Hello. Um, so I'm going to jump right back to the end of the Aufbau and hope to say somewhat quickly what I didn't get to say at the end last time. So um, I mean, I'm, so I'm going to start with this. So the so the purpose of the Aufbau is not to establish idealism. Um, you know, I or solipsism. I argued that pretty extensively last time. It's also not to prove that any statements of science are true, right? It's not even focused on that part. It's focused on the constructional system and not the deductive system. So, uh, um, but in fact, Carnap is just taking for granted the results of empirical science. So, I mean, so what is important in what it's doing? Well, um, it, it seems like the most important thing has to do with eliminating metaphysics. Um, right, with like uh, learning the lesson of responsibility from science and the lesson is gonna teach us how to get rid of metaphysics. Okay, so I mean, so what's so bad about metaphysics? Well, um, I mean, it's not bad just because it's not science, right? Carnap makes clear in section 183, where the title is rationalism, <laughs> with a question mark, right? Where he says, you know, um, um, my view is not, it's obviously not rationalist as opposed to empiricist, right? It's not rationalist in that history of philosophy sense. But he says, you know, um, more to the point, it's not rationalist as opposed to irrationalist. Meaning, you know, um, as he explains, it's not that he thinks that um, science or, you know, rational discourse about the truth is the only important thing in life or even the most important thing. He just thinks that, you know, um, if it's important at all, and it seems to be, then it's important to do it right, <laughs> I think is the way he argues there. So, I mean, so there's many other things, including many uses of language that fall outside of, of science. For example, the use of, one example he gives, this is also an example that Barclay uses, right? Use of language to get someone else to do something. Um, but also uh, um, the use of language in lyric poetry, he mentions. Um, sorry, there's a cat here. All right, go away. Um, so, I'm going to have to lecture. No. So uh, it's the use of language that expresses something for sure. It's not just a waste of time, but Carnap says it doesn't aim to do the same thing as. Um, as science does, it doesn't aim to express propositions that um, um, are true as opposed to false. So that if you say the opposite, you're disagreeing with the poet, or two poets are disagreeing with each other if they say the opposite thing. Right? That's not the way it works. They're both expressing their own attitude, emotions, something. So it's not that that he's that's bad about metaphysics, that it's not science, but he the way he defines metaphysics um, when he says something careful about it, this is on page 284, section 176. Um, He 
says, Metaphysics is the extra scientific domain of theoretical form. And what he means by theoretical here, he's alluding to the, um, well, originally Aristotelian, but um, I think here more directly, the Kantian distinction between theory and practice. Right, a theoretical question is a question uh, about what is true, what is the world really like, something like that. A practical question is a question about what we should do. So they're completely different kinds of questions. Um, and uh, it's the theoretical uh, question that, ex that requires you to determine whether a certain proposition is true or false. A practical question requires you to decide what to do. So um, so when he says that metaphysics is the extra scientific domain, uh, domain of theoretical form, he means that metaphysics, although it's not science, appears to be science. That is, that it, the metaphysicians act as if they're asserting things that they claim to be true, and if you say the opposite, you're disagreeing with them. Um, but it's extra scientific. Meaning, uh, there's no empirical way to decide who's right in such an argument. So, um, so, and so that's what's bad about metaphysics. Metaphysics um, is dealing with issues that are not really theoretical issues, but treating them as if they are theoretical issues. And there's a right way to deal with those same issues, only the right way is to recognize that they're not theoretical but practical. So, I mean, I think this, you know, you can see this when he talks about faith in section 181 on page 293. So he, so he talks about a meaning of faith in which faith would mean holding something to be true. Um, thus, for example, faith in a certain revelation or in the assertions of a certain person. I must be focused again. Faith in a certain revelation or in the assertions of a certain person can, through further investigation, lead to knowledge. For in this case, faith means the same thing as holding to be true, right? So if faith means believing certain things, but without sufficient justification, I can look for the justification, basically. So if, so if I say, you know, I, believe, I think so-and-so is true because of faith, someone else can say, well, I don't think it's true, but then we can decide who's right by verifying it. On the other hand, if by faith is meant the inner attitude, and attitude here is that word I was talking about at the end last time, haltung. So 
So it means um, more than just a, it doesn't mean like an inner feeling. It means like an inner, like halting means like holding yourself in a certain attitude, right? So it's like an inner determination, uh, like uh, intention, I think. So if by faith is meant the inner attitude of a person as something which cannot be conceptually formulated, then we are not even within the realm of theory. Right? So that's, he's saying, we're outside the realm of theory and we're in the realm of practice. And a, a certain, when you express a certain inner attitude, you're not expressing your opinion on what's true and false. You're expressing your determination to act in a certain way. Um, and sure enough, if you go back to the beginning of the preface, He says, what is the purpose of a scientific book? It is meant to convince the reader of the validity of the thoughts which it presents. So by the way, he's using in German and in the reading for this time in English, validity and truth as interchangeable. Um, so like I'm sure if you took Phil 9, it was drilled into you that truth is one thing and validity is something else, but that's like a later convention. Anyway, um, so it is meant to convince the reader of the validity of the thoughts which it presents. Um, however, this may not completely satisfy the reader. He may want to know in addition whence these thoughts came and where they lead, etc., etc. Only the book as a whole can demonstrate that the thoughts are correct. Here, outside the framework of the theory, but the truth is this could also be translated outside the framework of theory. A brief answer to the second question may be attempted. What position in contemporary philosophy and contemporary life in general does this book occupy? And, you know, what I was showing you at the end last time is that at the end of the preface, he says that the position this book occupies is that it expresses a certain haltung, a certain attitude of um, responsibility that we've learned from um, our being in proximity to physical scientists. And... Um, and uh, our work is carried forward by the faith that that haltung will carry the future. So it seems like it's the same kind of faith and haltung that he's talking about in section 181 he's using in the preface to talk about his own book. Um, so the, you know, Kantian context for this is like, why did Kant emphasize this distinction so much? Because as he says in the, um, preface to the second edition of the Critique of Pure Reason, um, he takes the moral of the whole book to be that I had to eliminate knowledge to make room for faith. Um, and it's, you know, so I had to eliminate, eliminate this in. This is an infinitive of the verb to know make room for glauben. And um, that's the title of section 181 of the Aufbau in German, Glauben und Wissen, Faith and Knowledge. So Carnap, I think, is pretty clearly alluding to this Kantian 
uh, to Kant's statement, I had to eliminate knowledge to make room for faith. What does that mean in Kant? Well, it means that the purpose of Kant's theoretical philosophy is to show that there's limits beyond which uh, we have no right to make theoretical assertions one way or the other. Um, and the reason it's important to Kant um, to um, prevent attempted science outside those limits, outside the boundaries of theory, is, well, I mean, there's kind of two reasons. One he emphasizes more in the first edition and the other more in the second edition, but the, here, here are two reasons. One is that once science steps outside of those bounds, um, it gets into um, insoluble conflicts with itself. One side says one thing, the other side says the opposite, and um, neither side can prove that the other is wrong. So they just go back and forth. Um, so Kant says, but uh, I can stop this debate by showing that the reason it's happening is that neither side has a right to the assertions that they're making. They can't claim that what they're saying is true or, and their opponents can't claim that it's false. Um, so that's one reason. And the second reason, so that's already kind of an ethical reason, right? I mean, on the surface, it may not sound like a really important ethical reason to prevent schools of metaphysicians from fighting each other for no good reason forever. But at least Kant at least thinks that those metaphysical disputes spill over into religion and then eventually into the real world. Um, whether that's true or not is hard to say, but Kant definitely says that that, that could happen, uh, whether that does happen. So maybe that's more important than it first sounds. But the second reason, he says, is that um, once science goes, attempts to go beyond the the borders of theory. Um, and Kant also uses the term metaphysics to describe what's happening here. Although there's also a good kind of metaphysics for, for Kant, but never mind that. So, you know, when science as metaphysics tries to go beyond the bounds of theory, um, it uh, seems to establish that ethics is impossible. For example, um, with you know within the bounds of theory, the things that we we have a right to talk about. And by the way, Kant agrees with, or Carnap agrees with Kant <laughs> that that those um, that that those are the things that are based on experience, that are empirical. Those are the things, um, or that are somehow related to experience, at least. Um, those are the things that we have a right to talk about, whereas what goes beyond experience is the thing that we don't. So, you know, so within the boundaries of theory, within the, the world of our experience, Kant thinks we can prove that the law of cause and effect has no exception. So every effect must have a cause. And it's a little bit more complicated than you might think, but, but, but anyway, if you, if you think about that principle, according to Kant, you'll see that it contradicts free will. Um, so, uh, I mean, when I say it's a little more complicated than you might think, it might seem like, yeah, duh, obviously that contradicts free will, but that's actually, it's, it's a little bit more complicated, but Kant um, believes that that law of cause and effect um, is inconsistent with with the existence of a free cause. And so he says that if science were allowed to extend that principle to everything, it would, uh, it would prove that free will is impossible. And Kant is one of those people who thinks that ethics makes no sense with, unless there's free will, right? So the solution for Kant is to eliminate knowledge. And so, like, we can find within the realm of our experience that statement that every effect must have a cause. And then, um, 
Um, and then we can't say anything theoretical about what's outside that boundary. But, we, but we're required for practical purposes to adopt the standpoint that there is free will, right? That is, as soon as we start deciding what to do, we presuppose that we have the ability to, to choose. Again, not as a theoretical proposition that we can, we can argue against opponents, but as a practical attitude or orientation. And that's what Kant calls practical faith, right? So when Kant says he's eliminated knowledge to make room for faith, that's what he means. He's, elimin he's, he's eliminated the supposed knowledge outside of this boundary to leave this space open for faith. Um, well, so of those two motivations, the first one to prevent needless strife, people arguing about things that are not really theoretical arguments, or at least not that uh, we can't express theoretical opinions about, and therefore that will never stop. That's, I mean, that's definitely one of Carnap's motivations, right? He mentions that pretty often. So Ryan asks, this is a good question. Is this related to Kant's essay on the common saying, this may be true in theory, but that does not apply in, pra in practice? Uh, yes, it is related to that, although it's mostly related to that in the sense that, you know, we often use theory and practice in a different way. Um, exa for example, in that saying. And uh, Kant is scandalized by that. This is the right way to use the terms. I, uh, I'm sorry. I would get, I would get more into that, but I have to get on with this. So, um, yeah. So yes, it is related to that. But, um, but so what I was saying is that first motivation to eliminate needless strife is also very important to Carnap. Um, again, you might think. Is this really a big deal? You know, people arguing with each other about, and you know, Carnap, like Kant, didn't manage to stop it. Whether rightly or wrongly, people are still to this day arguing about, you know, whether uh, composition is the same thing as identity, and how many shadows there are when two different things block the light and all kinds of questions that, uh, you know, whether, whether there can be the same thing in two different possible worlds, all these questions that Kant and Carnap both would want to reject are still going strong. But anyway, I mean, so I think Carnap like Kant, and I'm not sure either of them are right, but I think Carnap like Kant thinks that these metaphysical disputes are ultimately, you know, um, will spill over into political disputes so that there's, they have to be taken seriously. So, you know, so he wants to, that's one thing, but as for the other thing, well, he doesn't talk about it explicitly that much. Um, but, you know, if you look at the list of metaphysical problems that he tells you to dismiss towards the end of the alphabet, they're all clustered around the exact things that um, that Kant is worried about. Free will and determination is one of the things he talks about. Um, Mind-body problem, also closely related to this. Um, uh, you know, and causality and, uh, right? So, uh, like, um, um, I think it's pretty clear that that motivation is at work for Carnap, too. So this is actually really, something really important is going on here. It's about the possibility of ethics. And it's about the, the responsible attitude. And so now like responsible can be seen as not just like, um, um, I don't know, kind of like down to earth and not talking about 
things they don't know about or something. But responsible is like, I think should be read as like ethically responsible. Um, that's why at the very end of the Aufbau, he talks about Wittgenstein's Tractatus and the important ethical spirit that speaks from it or whatever. That's right. That's that all, that's what all this is connected to. So, um, so, you know, why doesn't he say more about that then? And I think the main reason he doesn't say more about that is that he's more radical than Kant. Um, you know, so Kant thinks there's a boundary between theoretical things that we can assert, like so that we can have knowledge of whether they're true or false, and theoretical things that we can say or think, but we don't really know what we're talking about. And for the purposes of ethics, then, he says, well, based on practical faith, we're able to give a meaning to some of those thoughts that for theoretical purposes, um, we did, we couldn't use. So we're able to say from a practical point of view, you know, God exists, there is free will, etc. things that from a theoretical point of view we couldn't talk about. Whereas Carnap wants to say that, or Carnap does say that science has no limits within theory. So any question that makes sense at all, theoretical question, can be answered by science in principle. The in principle is kind of important to keep remembering. Maybe I'll say why later when I talk about the changes in verificationism. But in principle, any theoretical question can be answered by science, Carnap thinks, so or maintains. Um, so that means that what's outside of this boundary is not things we can say, but we don't know what we're talking about, but rather just nonsense. We're not saying anything. And we can't like reclaim those things for practical purposes or something like that because nothing is being said at all. Um, so, uh, so that's why Carnap and uh, other people who follow Carnap in certain ways or who are similar to, so at least he thinks Wittgenstein and the Tractatus is on the same page with him on this. Um, Wittgenstein hated Carnap and wouldn't have anything to do with him. <laughs> In fact, Wittgenstein had these conversations with Moritz Schlick, um, and Carnap asked to sit in on it, and Wittgenstein said it was okay as long as he didn't have to see him. So Carnap had to sit somewhere where Wittgenstein faced away from him and he couldn't say anything. And it's a, yeah, anyway, but but yeah, so for Carnap and, and people who agree with him, the, uh, there's a lot, there tends to be a lot of irony involved in the, in the old ancient sense of like saying less than you know, right? Uh, that is... The, the, the thing that's most important you don't talk about because you can kind of hint at it, but the more you do that, the more likely you are to start trying to assert things about it, and that's exactly what you want to avoid. Okay, now there's another question about Carnap's influence coming a lot from neo-Kantians like Ernst Cassirer. Um So... Yeah, that's something that some people think that, that I actually don't think. <laughs> so maybe I'm not the right person to, to speak on their behalf. I mean, you know, Carnap was familiar with neo-Kantians, but, um, but in my understanding, he really comes much more out of the school of phenomenology, which is kind of a competitor with neo-Kantianism. Um, Right in the in those days before the origin of the current split between analytic and continental, it wasn't at first called that. But in, you know, before that, the big split in German philosophy was between phenomenologists and neo-Kantians. Um, and I would put Kant on the phenomenologist side. But anyway, um, there's some very capable people who disagree with me, though. So. You know, you should decide for yourself. Um, 
Okay, so that's all I wanted to say about that, and then I want to go on to the new material, unless there are more questions. I think I should say, again, this is, you know, I keep com coming back to this, and I will keep coming back to this, a way of understanding, like, how much is at stake in philosophy of science from the point of view of these people? It's um, as much as, as it's at stake for Kant, which in a sense is like infinitely much, right? Like nothing is more important than whether ethics is possible. <laughs> um, so, uh, um, So although, you know, as someone said last time, Kant really loves the math, and it, I mean, Carnap really loves the math, and it's true, and he loves these technical things, and he works them out at probably greater detail than is actually helpful, and whatever, but, uh, um, but you know, behind it is a much, is, a more readily understandable motivation, I guess I would say. Um, it's not just some weird hobby that he has. He, he thinks that this technical stuff is the key to, uh, to addressing, you know, the most fundamental issues in human life. All right. Um, so on that note, I will go on to discuss the new reading, which again is mostly from Carnap, although then we have Carnap disagreeing with Neurat. So, um, so the book that I first, the first part of the reading assignment is excerpts from this book, The Unity of Science. Um, this is kind of a, it's kind of a weird, it's, a, it's like a really little book. I had a physical book at one point. It's like really small. Um, and you can probably see even in the PDF, it has these really weird small pages. And what it is actually is a translation of a long German article that Carnap published in several installments in the, in the journal Erkenntnis. Um, and the title of the German article was uh, Die Physikalische Sprache als, als Universalsprache der Wissenschaft. The physical language as universal language of science. So, you know, when someone decided to translate it into English and publish it as a book, um, uh, I guess they also decided that that title, the physical language as universal language of science, wouldn't sell well in Britain, and they thought the unity of science was a a better title. So anyway, that's that's what this book is, and that you know, and that explains why Neurot is responding to it in German. He's responding to the original article. There's a footnote about it at the beginning of the Neurot translation, also. So, um, so uh, this is not much later than the alphabet. Um, it's like. I don't know why I didn't write down my notes what year it is. 1932. Alpha was 1928. So it's a few years later, but already some important things have changed. Um, one thing is that Carnap has taken a much clearer and more well defined position about. Um, language as the object of philosophy. Right, I mean, we saw in the Aufbau, and actually even in earlier stuff he wrote before the Aufbau, he was already talking this way about different languages and whatever, so it's not completely new, but he tries, but first of all, in this period, he tries to make it much stricter um, so, uh, 
right? This turns up in his distinction between the formal mode and the material mode. Um, not sure in exactly what sense the terms form and matter are being used there, but um, or whether kind of um, whether Carnap has thought about that or not. But um, right, so he introduces this difference at the beginning of section two in the unity of science. And basically, the material mode, it looks like we're talking about things and states of affairs. But when you translate it to the formal mode, we see that we're just talking about words and statements. And Carnap says that, you know, only the formal mode is, is strictly correct for consideration of philosophical problems. So like um, an example of this on page 45, Right, there's all these passages where he gives the formal mode in one column and the material mode in the other column. Um, except for one place where there's nothing in the formal mode column and he says that's because this is a metaphysical statement. It can't be expressed in the correct formal mode. <laughs> right, so, so anyway, so here, like, I'm gonna read the, the material mode sentence first or, or passage first. The simplest statements in the protocol language refer to the given and describe directly given experience or phenomena, that is, the simplest states of which knowledge can be had. Right, so that sounds a lot like what he says in the Aufbau about the basis of the system. The protocol sentences are not the basis of the system anymore, but, uh, but this sounds like what he says in the Aufbau about the basis of the system. It's going to be talk about the most epistemically primary things, the things that we can know immediately. But on the formal mode side, it says, the simplest statements in the protocol language are protocol statements. So, right, so instead of refer to, it just says are. Instead of saying they refer to the given, it says they are protocol statements. That is, statements needing no justification and serving as foundation for all the remaining statements of science. So the formal mode is about language. Um, now, I mean, you might think needing no justification, is that really just about languages? Or isn't that about something else, you know, about um, like, what basis I need for asserting a sentence in a language. But um, in, in this period, Carnap, this is called the logical syntax period. Um, and, you know, both because this is when he wrote the, the big book he wrote in this period is the logical syntax of language. But also because this, his view is that what the formal mode should describe, it's not just saying any old thing about language. I mean, after all, language is an empirical thing, right? I mean, empirical sciences can study it, and do study it. And uh, some linguists are empirical these days. I'm not sure they all are, but anyway, so empirical sciences can and do study sci language. So, you know, wouldn't that mean that philosophy is just a branch of linguistics or something like that? But it's, but it's you know, the formal mode should say only syntactic things about language is his view in this period. And what that means is that, I mean, you say things like, so I mean, here's a thing that you might say about language. If you've written P, well, I might say, 
we've written P and Q. Yeah, and the rule of our language is Now, so this is what we usually call a rule of inference. It's, but Carnap says it's a transformation rule. It's a rule for taking some stuff that you already have written. It takes in some input and in what you've already written, and it puts out a new statement as output. So if we've written P and Q, and the rule of our language is, um, you know, When you've written V and C, you may write V and C. Technically, I should put these little weird brackets here, but I'm just going to put I've written P and I've written Q. And the rule of our language is whenever you've written V and you've written C, you're allowed to write this. So, you know, therefore we can write P and Q. And these, you know, V and C are syntactic variables. They stand for some expression of the language. I know that's probably, for people who have fuzzy screens, that's probably, well, actually, maybe for everyone, that's totally illegible. Does someone want to ask a question about what I wrote there? <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> yeah, quick question. What yeah. are the symbols that you use for uh, V and C? What are, what are these? Those, yeah. are, those are supposed to be the Greek letters P and C in my terrible writing. Is what they are. Gotcha, okay, for sure. <laughs> Lowercase letters, not, not the, like the big P that I wrote there. All right. Um, yeah, and the reason, well, no, I'm, I'm not going to get bogged down in that. You know, but anyway, so P and C you know, stand for some, some kind of expression in the language. And, you know, I mean, not for just any expression. You have to be careful about how you define this. But T uh, Professor, your, um, the camera has uh, turned off. Oops. The, uh, the whiteboard. I see that. And once again, I can't do anything about it. Because when, ha when this happens, my screen, like my cursor freezes. I can't do anything. <laughs> um... Yeah, it's the effect of trying to use not just Zoom, but also this other piece of software called ManyCam, which doesn't always work right. But I think that's what's causing this. Anyway, I know from experience it will fix itself. So, right, so without pointing to the picture, oh, let's come back. It usually seems to happen once in every lecture this quarter. And I wonder if it's always at the same time. <laughs> if I could figure out when it's coming and <laughs> have like an interlude. Well, anyway, <laughs> um, so, so the point is like what, what we're saying here, not only is it about language, but um, it doesn't really have any content about the language. It's a tautology about the language. Right? That is obviously, if this is a rule of the language, and we've written down this and this, then obviously we're allowed to write this. That's what the rule means. So, um, so like, we're not making any claim about what actual languages are like. So that... Um, 
So this, uh, and yet we're not talking about anything other than language. We're not talking about the state of affairs that P and Q stand for or something like that or their truth conditions, or their truth values. We're just talking about the symbols. We're saying something about the symbols that has basically no theoretical content. Why are we saying it? Well, um, we're saying it for practical reasons, because considering things like this is going to help us decide which language to choose, like which language to, to set up, which language to adopt. Um, um, describing the, the different possibilities, how they would work. Um, so, um, Right, and so in this period, Carnap thinks that um, f that formal mode will consist in in taking everything that um, seems to be a philosophically interesting question or proposition and turning it into syntactic facts about language. Um, So why am I emphasizing that thing about syntax so much? It like it's probably maybe not that important for our purposes. Although when we the the final reading from Carnap, we'll see how he changed from that position, and you know, and that that is kind of important fact about the history of of uh, logical positivism. Um, that so basically. Um, after Carnap met Tarski and learned about Tarski's theory of truth, he decided that um, it's okay to not only talk about syntax, but also talk about semantics. Um, so, like, um, you know, the semantic description of inference might say something like, um, um, in every model of our language in which P and Q both come out true, P and Q also comes out true, and we can prove it, right? So now we're no longer talking about the symbols, just we're starting to talk about what, they, what they're about again. And so, like, in a period after the logical syntax period, Carnap introduces what he calls formal semantics, and then he writes a new book about formal semantics. Um, and, you know, like the way we teach logic now, I assume the way it gets taught in Phil 9 is, is like post that shift to semantics, right? So, um, so like, um, so what, so in particular, you know, when Carnap says, um, that the protocol statements are statements that require no justification. He means um, that uh, um, by the rules of our language, we're allowed to write them down after nothing. So, right, like that rule of inference that we just saw said what you're allowed to write down given that you've already written down something else. That's the syntactic understanding of what inference is. And so Carnap is basically saying that the protocol sentences, he's saying that they have the syntactic status of axioms or uh, logically valid statements, um, which just means... Um, if the set of statements that you've written down so far is no statements, an empty set, then you're allowed to write down a protocol statement. That's the way that you can use that. Um, 
whereas like a semantic understanding of that would would, would it would be more like and I, and again I think this is probably what you learned in Phil nine that a logically valid statement is a statement that's true in every model of the language um, and an axiom constrains what the models can be like so um, right but so and that's all kind of a side issue. If you didn't understand it, or if I explained it wrong, which is possible, then just disregard it. But um, um, but I'm I'm go I went off that tangent just to show that when Carnap translates to the formal mode and he says can be written down without justification, he means you don't have to consult what you've already written to decide whether you can write the protocol sentence. You have the right to write whatever you want in your protocol. This is a point where Neurod is going to get upset. Okay, so that's all. That's one thing that's changed. Another thing that's changed is. Um, the move to physicalism. So, like, what physicalism means depends on who you ask. So, like, Carnap and Neurot don't quite agree on what it means, let alone people they, these days who talk about physicalism. But for Carnap, physicalism means um, basically that you ought to choose a physical basis for your constructional system in the terminology of the Aufbau. Right, so whereas in the Aufbau he said, you know, a physical basis is good for some purposes. For our purposes, we want a auto psychological basis. For some other purpose, you might want a psychological basis. Um, and therefore, if you asked him, is everything really physics? He would translate that into the question, what basis should I adopt? And the answer would be, well, it depends. <laughs> So, you know, here the change to physicalism means that now if you ask him, is everything really physics, he'll say, again, say that's a metaphysical question. There's no theoretical issue there of whether everything is really physical or not. Um, uh, but I can translate it into a formal mode question. Um, what's the best rules to adopt for our language? And now he thinks that there's a, one answer to that, or, well, maybe there's still different versions of physical basis that you could use. But anyway, the answer is use a physical basis. And actually, most of this article, and that's why in German it's called the physical language as universal language of science, is arguing for why the physical basis is the appropriate basis to use. Um, and um, at least officially, the answer is, well, number one, so, I mean, meaning, so if, if we're going to use a physical basis, that means that in our system, everything in principle can be translated into a statement in physical language. Right? Just as in the Aufbau, the fact that we had an auto-psychological basis meant that in principle everything we say could be translated into a language of my experiences. So, um, um, and he says, well, that's appropriate because number one, the physical language is universal. That is, there is a way of translating everything into physical language. So, I mean, so far we haven't departed from the Aufbau, right? Because already in the Aufbau he says a physical basis would work. But he says also an auto psychological basis would work. Um, so, I mean, and he doesn't really disagree with that now either, I think. He still thinks there could be an auto, a system with an auto psychological basis. Oh, I missed this question. Why are your disjunction symbols upside down? Because they're not disjunction system, symbols, they're conjunction symbols. <laughs> so they're right side up. 
All right, but they're gone now anyway. So, um, yeah, that's one of the ways of writing and. I don't know. There's many different ways of writing the and operator in logic. Uh, that's one of them. Anyway, sorry, getting back to this. So, um, um, so in this case too, he thinks that the auto psychological language could also be a universe is also a universal language, but it's not a good universal language because it's not um, intersubjective and um, not intersubjective means something like not everyone can speak it. I mean, you have to be careful and, you know, maybe Neurath is right to say that if you think about this really carefully, you'll see it doesn't really make sense. I mean, kind of, kind of gives up on this in response to him, or at least completely changes the subject. Um, but, you know, but the thought is that this, the sentences that, um, um, talk about my experience, um, if they remain untranslated into anything, are sentences that you can neither assert nor deny. Um, so, uh, of course, that doesn't mean you can't say anything about my experience. But Carnap says, you know, how can you say something about my experience? Well, you have to translate the statements about my experiences. And again, this is the same thing he said in the Aufbau, so he hasn't changed his mind about this. You have to translate the statements about my experiences into the physical language. And then you translate the statements of the physical language into your own statements about your own experiences, and then you can affirm or deny that. But meanwhile, um, the problem isn't solved. It's just been shifted, right? Because now you've translated all the statements about my experience into your language that I can't speak. <laughs> and so there's everyone speaking a different language. And everyone can kind of um, um, say things in the same words that people use in their language to describe their experiences and you know so, uh, to stop saying that long thing and I guess this is why this terminology got taken up so you wouldn't have to keep saying this long thing call the language I use to talk about my experiences my protocol language right so like I can I can uh, you know find a way to agree with things that you say in your protocol language but it happens by translating them into physical language and then into my protocol language. So, um, whereas he says the physical language is better because it's intersubjective, we're all we can all be talk, speaking the same language, and then. So what about my protocol language and your protocol language? Well, as he claims towards the end of the article, you know, the protocol languages can also be translated into the physical language. Now, I mean, that was that was part of the story before about the bad way of going, right? The auto psychological way. Um, that the way I can understand you is to translate you to the physical your protocol language into the physical language. But he's saying the problem is that I went, then went on to translate it into my own protocol language, which you can't speak. Um, so I changed the problem being from I can't speak your language to you can't speak my language, but it doesn't help, right? So um, whereas if we both stop at the physical language, then we both translated our respective protocol languages into a language we can both speak. So that at least is officially the motivation for physicalism. Um, I think it also has something to do with Carnap already negotiating with Neurath and trying to avoid, uh, arrive at a common platform for how to go forward. 
and as I'll say more when I talk about Neurot, um, uh, Neurot, I mean, Carnap was a, a socialist, but he was not a Marxist, whereas Neurot was a, um, um, was a Marxist and a, I guess it, like a relatively, or at least wanted to be a Marxist in good standing. I mean, like he actually, I, did I mention this before in this class? He actually traveled to Stalinist Russia to advise the government. Um, I don't think they paid any attention to whatever he told them, but he, he thought of himself as, you know, like someone who could be involved in, uh, um, in the official Marxist circles. And so he was obviously, to do that, you have to be a materialist. Right, it's called dialectical materialism. You can't say, you know, oh yeah, materialism is one language for talking about the world, but there's also other languages. You have to say materialism is the right language. So like Carnap can't exactly say that, but this is as close as he can come to it. <laughs> um, anyway, um, um, so like the result of this change is that, um, there's still there's still just one language, one structure, right? And like as I drew it before, you know, at the bottom are the fundamental objects and relations, and then we're going to use some kind of constructional forms. And you know, there may have been some, there have been some changes in that too, but that's less important. We're going to use some constructional forms to build up objects at higher and higher level. And that way we're going to get everything, all, all the objects that are needed for science and everyday life are going to find themselves in this structure somewhere. So, um, and that shows, number one, the unity of science. But somehow this structure is also supposed to show that um, the, like, empirical meaningfulness of science. This says meaningfulness, <laughs> right? It's supposed to show the empirical meaningfulness of science. So in the Aufbau system, the, the way showed that second thing was also by means of the same like reduction or construction relation, right? It was, you know, not only does having this one basis show that we're all talking about the same, that all the talk about different types of objects is really all talking about the same thing, but because in the Aufbau system, the thing that's here is my experience, it shows that what all these things are really talking about is my experience, or I mean that they can be so regarded, right? I can I can choose to translate everything I say about them into statements about my own experience, in such a way that I accept that 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 um, after the translation I have an equivalent statement. Yes, I mean, the fact that he describes it that way in the Aufbau shows that he hasn't adopted this strict syntactic approach yet, right? In the formal mode, there isn't anything to add except that a rule allows me to translate one to the other. I've chosen a language that, with such a rule. But so in any case, right, um, but now in the new system, this basis is not my experience. So the fact that everything can be reduced to this physical basis, and you know, whenever he describes it in this paper, he says that it's something like the you know magnitude of different fields at different points in space. Um, but you could also think of it as positions of particles, or you know, it's another possibility that he discusses in some places. But anyway, that's what's on this fundamental level, and. Um, you know, uh, it seems like there's many things you can say about the distribution of fields and space and whatever that are not um, um, 
that I don't have any empirical knowledge of. So, uh, like, so showing that everything can be reduced to this is not in itself showing empirical meaning, meaningfulness. So how do we show empirical meaningfulness now? And he says, well, there's a new way, namely that the protocol sentences. So it's a little tricky. I mean, first he says the sentences of the protocol language can be translated into a part of the system. Then after he, afterwards he says, and since they can be translated, they're really the same statement. And then we'll see in response to Norva, he kind of takes that back. So anyway, is that, however you think of this exactly, the sentences of my protocol language correspond to some language, some sentences in this system. So these sentences can be reduced to the physical basis. So they're basically statements about my body and its behavior. Um, right, so the protocol sentence angry now can be translated. Um, I mean, there's, pro there's probably many different ways of doing it, right? Because again, you just need to find some physical state of affairs that is um, equivalent to my protocol sentence angry now, right? So if I write my protocol uh, angry now, you're going to translate that into a sentence about my body, that it's acting angry at a certain time. Right? I mean, we're going to have to know how to translate from times in the protocol to times in the world also. Um, so, and then that statement about my body, well, it's not yet a statement about fundamental particles and fields or whatever, but as it's plausible, it can be reduced to that, right? So that's the idea. But then, so what makes everything in this system empirically meaningful? And the answer is that um, not that everything in this system can be translated into something about this, just this part, right? Meaning that, like, for anything you could say about any type of object, there would be an equivalent that's about this part but rather that anything you can say about any object here has some consequences for this part. Or he's already loosening that even a little bit. It's the kind of thing that in principle could have consequences for that part. So it means that I'm no longer going to have um, necessary and sufficient conditions for the truth of everything I can say in our system language. Um, right? I'm not going to be able to say that, like, you know, even for singular statements, like there's a red ball on the table, I'm not going to be able to say there's a red ball on the table if and only if I have the following experiences. But um, I am going to be able to say, um, if there's a red ball on the table, then this is the type of experiences that that would produce. There might be other things that would produce those same experiences, like a hallucination of a red ball on the table or whatever. But nevertheless, the red ball on the table does have some implications for my experience of it, so it's for my experiences. So it's a weaker requirement of empirical meaningfulness. Do people understand the change there? I don't know if I used a good enough example. Um, um, so, right, I mean, let me just 
put the same thing in a shorter way, right? Now empirical meaningfulness means has some empirical consequences. Whereas before empirical meaningfulness meant on the basis of my experience, I can decide for sure whether it's true or false. Now it just means if it's true, it will produce certain experiences. Um, but that doesn't, you know, but just because I have those experiences doesn't enable me to say it's true, and just because I don't have them doesn't enable me to say it's false. It's not equivalent to it anymore. It just means it makes some empirical difference. Um, so, I mean, so this, I guess, also leads into or kind of shows the reason for, or is the content of, <laughs> the retreat from verification again. Um, or the loosening of verification again. Verifi strict verificationism means that if something is empirically meaningful, its meaning is, you know, it prescribes a procedure which I can carry out and in a finite time, and when I finish carrying it out, I'll know whether it's true or false. Um, where so so in switching so the, so the Aufbau system is a strict verificationist system, and now we're switching to one that's not strictly verificationist. However, um, it's important not to make more of that than is really going on because you have to remember that in the alphabet system it's in principle right there's a procedure that this fictitious subject a could in principle carry out that would determine for sure whether a given, sta given statement is true or false but in fact it's impossible right so uh, like because we had to remember what we had to assume about A. Number one, we had to assume that all of A's experiences are in and there aren't going to be any more. So that assumption is never true <laughs> while well, you're still alive, right? It's never true. So um, so that explains why, like, you know, if I say there's a way of telling for sure whether there's a red ball on the table or not. You might think that I'm telling you something you could do so that you could never be surprised and find out there wasn't really one there. It was really a hologram or an illusion or whatever. But, you, I mean, yes, I'm claiming to tell you that, but I'm claiming to tell you a way you could know that if you know that you're never going to have another experience. And that, I mean, maybe it's still questionable, but it seems a lot more reasonable, right? Like, there isn't going to be no more evidence coming in that shows that, no, it wasn't really red, or no, it wasn't really there, it was a mirror, you know, whatever, right? We're, we're done. All the facts that I'm ever going to get have been considered. So, so that assumption by itself shows why that in principle verifiability has nothing to do with real verifiability. But then there was further assumptions we had to make about A. For example, that A remembers every single experience that A has ever had and can keep track of them as individuals and as a list of which ones were recollected as similar to which other ones, which A, uh, you know, um, knows by heart, so to speak, or at least has enough time and patience to check very carefully. This is going to be a very, very long list. <laughs> and I mean, we don't, in real life, we don't even have the beginning of it. Right? Like, how many of your fundamental gestalt experiences of a certain instant do you remember? The answer may well be none. <laughs> I mean, you're never even conscious of them directly, as Carnap admits in the Alpha. Um, 
So like, um, so, so, so the change here is, I guess you would say from like a strict, from a logical point of view, it's a huge change, right? We've gone from claiming that empiricism means I can translate everything into empirical language to saying, well, empiricism means that everything has some kind of empirical consequences. Um, so we've gone from something really strict and rigorous to something much looser. But if what you're interested in is the practical attitude of holding your statements up to experience for testing by other subjects and being able to use that to resolve disagreements, or at least to work towards resolving disagreements, to gather evidence for and against, then the situation in real life hasn't changed very much, if at all, right? It was always going, even on the old system, what we were gonna do in real life was always just to gather some evidence for or against our statements, not to literally verify them using this procedure. Um, okay, I went on about that probably longer than I should have, although it's pretty important, but, um, it's time that I get on to Neurot, unless there's questions about what I was just saying. No. Last discussion was about the conjunction symbols. Yeah, sometimes people use an ampersand, sometimes they use that, like, V th operator, sometimes they use a dot. Um, sometimes they just use like multiplication, just writing the two things next to each other. <laughs> you see all kinds of things. Anyway, um, uh, all right, so Neurot, um, I probably should say more about Neurot's biography and stuff like that, but there's clearly no time for that. We're gonna see Neurot again. Maybe I'll talk more about it than I was then, but I mean, but you can tell from the way Neurot and Carnap write to each other, an important fact, which is that, I mean, well, number one, they agree about a lot of things, you know, about getting rid of metaphysics and about empiricism and in this stage about physicalism and so forth. But probably even more important than that, they view each other as co-workers on a common project. Right? And they both feel that they're settling some technical stuff that has to get cleared out of the way at the beginning. But soon we're going to get onto the real positive project of logical analysis of science or whatever. They, um, the, the truth is they may not actually agree on what the project is. I'm about to say in a second. But they, but they both think that they agree in principle about what the project is. So, um, um, right, so that's, that's going to be very different from the way Neurot writes about Popper, where, you know, Neurot says Popper looks like one of us, but he isn't. So, um, so, I mean, Having said that, it's not really the case that Neurot's it's not really the case that Neurot's criticisms of Popper are purely technical criticisms. Right? You made a mistake on page seven. It should have been conjunction, not disjunction, or whatever, something like that. It's um, they they are basically like ideological criticisms. And and I think, I mean, you can see the political differences between them coming out clearly, not so much in Carnap's response, but in Neurath's original criticism of Carnap, right? Like he emphasizes certain things like materialism, as I was mentioning. So, you know, um, uh, Carnap has, as I said, I think has done his best to, to uh, like give his endorsement of materialism, but it's really not good enough for Neurot um, because it's still like, um, 
as I was pointing out, the whole point is that that philosophy is still not going to be about language um, as, or, sorry, that, so the point is that everything that has content is going to be able to be translated into a physical statement, but the other point is that philosophy um, says things that uh, can't be anyway don't need to be translated into physical language because they're tautologous so philosophy is just talking about is is not talking about language as a material thing it doesn't matter when i write down a rule like you know if i say let phi be the the one proposition that can be expressed in a language then sorry that's obscene <laughs> let C be one thing that can be written down in language, and let phi be another thing, and let you know this be the name of a conjunction operator. Um, then blah 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 blah. Um, it doesn't matter what the propositions of the language and the conjunction operator actually are. They could be, at one point, David Lewis uh, discusses a language in which everything is a name for itself. <laughs> I mean, it's, he has a good reason for it, actually. He's making an interesting point that, that that's a possible language and, you know, then seeing what we could do with it. But, right, you can, like, I mean... In that language where everything is a name for itself, you could figure out what, you know, what relationships between things constitute propositions and what corresponds to the conjunction operator. Um, and it's not marks on paper or sounds in the air or anything like that, right? It's some complicated physical relationship. But these syntactic things will still go through because they don't, we don't care what the expressions of the language are. So Neurath thinks that that's a mistake. Right, Carnap thinks this again has to do with this question of like what's left for philosophy? How can we explain why philosophy, why although um, in some sense there's only science, philosophy is not science but something else. So, um, um, whereas Doirat, like at the end of his paper, it's towards the end. Can I find it? But it's oh yeah, it is towards the end. Here we go. Oops. Now this is again out of focus. They say we're going to be back in person soon. Let's see if that actually happens. I have mixed feelings about it, but at least would avoid this. Well, although actually when I'm in person, I don't have a good way of showing text to the class at all, so maybe I shouldn't say that. Maybe this is better. Anyway, um, so Neurath says here, the word man, in German it's mensch, I'm pretty sure. I didn't check the original for this, but in German it's mensch, which doesn't mean man as opposed to woman. So let's say the word human, which is prefixed to makes assertions, is to be defined in just the same way as the word human occurring in sentences which contain the words economic system and production. Right, what Norad is saying is that sentences are things we make with our labor, just like, you know, widgets. <laughs> um, so, um, and that's the only way we should think about them. 
Right. So that's why, you know, like when Carnap says everyone has their own protocol language that, you know, contains these primitive statements that are, you know, in a material mode we could describe as directly given to experience. Um, uh, of course, Carnap doesn't mean that there's everyone really is carrying around a notebook with stuff written in this language that describes their their basic experiences. He, you know, what does he mean? He means there's a possible linguistic structure that we can describe syntactically that would serve this purpose for someone, something like that. Whereas, you know, so Neurot takes one look at that and says, you know, uh, what if someone wrote down two contradictory statements in their protocol at the same time? Then what do you do? <laughs> Neurot is thinking of it as an actual notebook that someone actually writes in. And he's not, I think, just misunderstanding Carnap. He's deliberately switching it from one to the other to try to teach Carnap that, you know, the way he's thinking about language is, um, well, is, so I already used the term ideological to describe Neurot, but now, I mean, to use it as a tactical Marxist term, right? That, that you know, Neurot says, look, what you're doing about language is ideology, it's in you know the title of the German ideology or whatever. Um, it's you're concealing the true material facts and the relations of production that lie behind them, or that well that they involve or whatever. So you know that's so Neurath's criticism partly rests on that, um, and then uh, my notes up in all this. But also, I think Neurath sees as connected to that the fact that um, Carnap's linguistic proposals are not serious in the sense that um, we're not actually going to ever speak the language that Carnap imagines. Or that Carnap, see, I mean, I guess Carnap would say, I don't imagine it. I just describe it mathematically. Whatever associations I might have with that are irrelevant, right? So, um, um, right, so like philosophers have tried to understand the world. The, the point, however, is to change it. So when Neurot thinks about the, the new language for science that we're going to adopt, he thinks about a language that, so great, he literally says we're going to teach children a simple version of this language so that they'll never know any other language, and then they'll grow up and they'll get a more complicated version of it. And the language we're going to teach children, I mean, on the one hand, it's pretty radical. Like, it's not going to have any first-person pronouns in it. You're not going to be able to say, I see a red ball on the table now. It's not going to have, also not going to have the words here and now in it, Neurath says. Right? Instead of, I see a red ball on the table now, I'm going to have to say something like, Abe's protocol at you know, whatever time it is, class almost over, <laughs> running out of time on January 20th, 2022. Abe said to himself, uh, you know, the only other thing in the room with Abe at such and such a time is a red ball on the table. <laughs> and it's actually more complicated than that. I left out one of the nested quotations. So, uh, you know, but... Um, and yeah, we're going to teach children that right away. Um, and, you know, and so on that basis, he objects to the forms that Carnap proposes for protocol sentences or for the relationship between protocol sentences and the system language. I don't know, I could write down here, but, you know, change the world. <laughs> Um, 
And he says, look, you know, uh, we don't have a way of translating. So maybe we can translate, we can make some progress to translating there's a red ball on this table into statements about particles and fields. But what about Abe? Do we know how to translate that into a statement about particles and fields? And he says, well, no, I mean, it's just not a very precise term for one thing. You know, like, is this piece of hair part of it? What about, you know, this nail that's almost coming? Right, like, it's not really, the boundaries are not comp not that precise. Um, um, and, I mean, there's presumably a lot of other problems in the way of translating a name like Abe or Otto or Rudy, right? Rudy, Uncle Rudy is Rudolf Carnap, presumably. So he, the, the examples he uses here are him and his name and Carnap's name. Um, so, um, so you know, and we can't wait for the, the far off day when maybe we'll be able to eliminate personal names in far favor of descriptions of particles and fields. We have to start right away and we're gonna use what Neurot calls the universal slang. He actually uses the English word slang which I don't think he completely understands. <laughs> he probably should have called it pigeon or something. But anyway, we're gonna use this universal slang of science, which is gonna be a combination of precise scientific terms and vague terms like Otto and Abe, right? So um, um, we have to do that because we have to get to work on teaching people to speak it. And Neurath actually spent a lot of time working on a new language of symbols um, and tried to teach it to workers in factories <laughs> and get them to adopt it. I don't think he got very far. Um, that's probably what he was trying to advise, you know, the government in, in the Soviet Union to do. I'm sure they were not interested. But in Neurath's mind, this was a very important and pressing project, and we had to get work to work on it right away. Um, I see that I've left only two minutes to discuss, describe Carnap's response to Neurath. So again, maybe I'm going to have to go over, uh, this is becoming a bad habit, but hopefully next week it'll have to be cut off because we're going from one author to a completely different author. So anyway, I probably will have to say something about it at the beginning next time, but um, I just want to point out that there is this ironic, I guess maybe in both senses of ironic. So, I mean, Carnap responds, first of all, by changing his position in pretty important ways, right? So he actually accepts a lot of Neurath's criticism, but the moral he takes from it is not the morals that Neurath wants, right? His new position, I don't think Neurath would like any better. <laughs> so, um, and his, basically his new position is that there's two different ways of thinking about the relationship between the protocol language and the system language. And he says, the way I was thinking about it was that, you know, go up to anyone, say some Negro who speaks an unknown language, so that example is kind of worrying, but in a way he's just responding to Neurath because Neurath's own example was the Bantu language. I think Carnap may even be making the point that the way Neurath is thinking about the Bantu is colonialist. <laughs> I wouldn't want to go too far on a limb to, to say that that's, the point, that's a point he's making. But anyway, so we go up to any old person, they use whatever language they feel comfortable with, and we figure out how to translate it into statements of the system language. Well, the picture's not there anymore, but statements of the system language. And so he's saying Neurath's proposal is slightly different. Neurath's proposal is that we train everyone to speak our system language. And now all the protocol statements are already part of the system language because everyone uses the system language to describe their experiences. <laughs> um, and he says, this is on page um, 
464. Yay. He says on page 464, um, um, now that I found 464, I can't find it. Oh yeah, here we go. So in this case, we prompt B to replace the reaction re or ray by the reaction it is raining, it is raining, and correspondingly for the remaining sounds. Right? So ray was the the sound that B used to emit when it was raining. But we now we train B to say it is raining instead, that is to speak our language. That is an operation, habituation, retraining, disconditioning, and conditioning, so to speak, transconditioning, which, as is well known, su succeeds with many animals and human beings in many cases, and in others not. <laughs> so, uh, I think that's an ironic comment on the um, political implications of the way Neurath is thinking about the situation. Yes, if you treat people like animals and, tr and train them to speak your language, no matter what they want, um, sometimes that succeeds, sometimes not. <laughs> All right. Anyway, I'm sorry. I've gone over three minutes, uh, and uh, I will see you uh, all next week. Bye.